guys. Let's talk about chapter uh, three here, orbits and gravity. Uh, we've got a uh, uh, animation here of a rocket launch that is going to be related to uh, Newton's laws uh, and how to get things in orbit. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We want to know the laws of planetary motion, how they move and why, uh, Newton's great th uh, synthesis and how he used the laws to create his universal law of gravitation, which we'll talk about after that and then talk about just specifically orbits in our solar system, motions of the satellites and spacecraft, and then what happens when you get more than one object interacting gravitationally. Okay, okay. So, think ahead. How could you find a new planet that was too dim to see? Let's say you were trying to look for something, but it was too far away, didn't look like it was moving, you couldn't watch it move, it was too dim to really see. How would you discover if there was another planet out there or not? We could use Newton's law of gravitation, which is what Le Verrier did to predict Neptune, which is how it was discovered. It was based on anomalies in Uranus's orbit, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, Uranus's orbit didn't quite match where it was predicted, but we could fix it if we assume there was another planet tugging on Uranus a little bit, and that turned out to be Neptune. So we're going to start talking by uh, talking about the laws of planetary motion and what you want to get out of this section is to learn a little bit about Tycho Brahe and uh, Johannes Kepler and how they contributed to our understanding of the motions of the planets. And then the main thing is to explain Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. So recall that Copernicus, he had an idea of a sun-centered solar system and it was bolstered by Galileo's observations of the phases of Venus. But it wasn't until Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler laid a firm observational foundation and a mathematical basis for the heliocentric model. Remember, the previous geocentric model worked just fine to predict when and where the planets were going to be, but it made more sense uh, based on Galileo's thing if there was a heliocentric uh, solar system. But there wasn't a lot of reason to change that, so you had to have a lot of good evidence. Those guys did that. So Tycho Brahe was born after Copernicus published his work. He was famous for studying supernova 1572, which is a supernova, a star that blew up. You could see it at night temporarily. It's called Tycho's supernova, uh, supernova, and if you want to study it today, that's what you would call it. This is Tycho Brahe and his mustache. Um, yeah, there it is, okay. This is Tycho's supernova. Uh, this is a supernova remnant. It's what's left over. You can see it just looks like an explosion. Um, the star blew up, and this is what's left. All the colors tell you what it's made out of, all the different uh, elements there. Um, and this is a pretty cool little video here showing you over the time. You can see how it's kind of still expanding out over the 15 years that this, these pictures were taken. You can see it just poofing out. So worth studying, you know, poof, there's nothing to stop the junk from going out, so it's continuing, continuing to expand. So, back to Tycho Brahe and his work. He kept extensive records of the locations of the sun, the moon, and the planets for 20 years. Very good data, very precise data on their locations at his um, observatory. Uh, his measurements varied, this was an important detail, from the geocentric model. Okay, so you had the geocentric model predicting the locations. Well, they didn't exactly predict them. Based on Tycho's measurements, they were slightly off. So that's important, because now we have a reason to switch to the heliocentric model. Um, but he wasn't. Tycho Brahe was not able to analyze the data and create a theoretical model, uh, so he enlisted the help of Johannes Kepler, who was a mathematician. And Kepler worked with Brahe, uh, especially after he died, to develop a heliocentric model of the solar system. It took him 20 years to develop the three laws of planetary motion. So, you know, if, it, if you don't learn what these three laws are in, you know, 10 minutes, it's okay. It took him 20 years to figure this stuff out. I'm sure if you had 20 years, you could do it too. So he published the first two laws in 1609 in this uh, publication called The New Astronomy. And this is it. That's the picture of it, front cover. His first law of the two that were published says that um, an object orbits in ellipses. Okay, so what is an orbit? It's just the path an object takes through space. Kepler assumed that the orbits were circular, but what he found out is that they're actually elliptical. Instead of being circular, they're a little bit more elliptical. And ellipses are just little squished circles a little bit, like you're sitting on a workout ball or something. Um, so this is how he did it, basically. Mars is 687 days to orbit back to where it was. So he recorded where Earth was, 
boop, and then he recorded where Earth was the next time Mars got back to where it started. Boop, where was Mar where was Earth when Mars got back? So he's trying to figure out where, boop, there's Mars, this is Earth, as Mars orbits. Okay, so if you connect the dots here, then Earth is on this orbit, which is an ellipse. A circle is this dashed line. So Earth is almost on a circular path, but not quite. So it's on an elliptical orbit. That's how, um, that's the type of data he was taking and just using geometry to figure this out. And there's his originally original publication showing um, what you'd expect in the Copernicus model, where orbits are circular, in the Ptolemaic model, um, where the planets do their weird thing and the Earth is the center, and then in his model, and then do -do 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 -do, it's exactly where uh, the data matched, okay? So, um, Kepler's first law. Orbits are ellipses. What is an ellipse? Okay, they're conic. It's a conic section. So if you take a cone and you slice it in different ways, you get the different ge geometric shapes here. You get a circle if you just slice it right through the middle. You get an ellipse if you slice it diagonal. You get a parabola if you slice it through to the bottom, and then a hyperbola if you slice it through all the way over here. Uh, an ellipse is you take a circle, and instead of having one radius, you've got a long radius and a short radius, or a semi-major axis and a semi-minor axis. Um, circles, they have a single radius. Ellipses have a major and minor axis, a long and short one. The squishiness of an ellipse is called its eccentricity. It varies from zero to one. Um, the orbits of the planets are very close to circles, so they have very low eccentricities. You wouldn't be able to tell that they're circles just by looking at them. Whereas a football, you look at a football and you say, that's not a circle, right? You look at a basketball, that's a circle. Football, that's an ellipse. Okay, so um, Kepler's second law says that as planets orbit the sun, they sweep out equal areas in equal times. What this means is that the planet's speed changes as it goes through the orbit. When it's closer to the sun, it speeds up. When it's further away from the sun, it slows down. That's, the, that's what you need to know about Kepler's second law. Um, it just moves fastest when it's closest to the host star. This is how it works. Mars is going to sweep out equal tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. In those equal times, it's sweeping out the same amount of area. Every one of these little sections has the same square footage. Okay, they're the same areas. And you can see as Mars goes through there, it's slow and then speeds up and then slows down and then speeds up and slows down. Each one of these things is an equal area. You can think about it square footage, like in an apartment. This might be a galley kitchen. This is more of an open concept. It's the same square footage. This is long and narrow. This is kind of shorter and wider. Okay, you get the same square footage, but it has to march out the same square footage in the same time, which means slower here, faster there, faster, slower, faster, slower. Okay, so that's the second law. You move fastest when you're closest to a planet. Kepler's third law is this mathematical formula that says that the time it takes to orbit is equal to the distance you are away from the star. So it depends on that, and it depends like p squared equals a cubed. So don't worry, it's a little bit mathy, but you don't have to know the math. p here represents the period, how long it takes to go around. The unit is one year, or a year, if you want to measure the period in years. Um, that's the time it takes to orbit, or the length of the year for that planet. For Earth, it is one year. That's the time it takes Earth to go around the sun is one year. Um, a, this variable A, represents the semi-major axis of the orbit. Okay, and for uh, Earth, you can put 1 AU for uh, A. So as long as you have years in for P and AU for A, you can use this equation to figure out how long it takes a planet to orbit the sun. A quick aside on, you might be asking, what the heck is, is an AU? An AU is called an astronomical unit, and it's a new unit. It was defined as the diff average distance the Earth is from the Sun. Remember, the Earth is an elliptical orbit, so it's not constantly the same distance from the Sun. So we take the average of that distance, and we define that to be a new unit, just like your foot is a foot, you know, and you want to take 12 feet, you just walk 12 steps. If you want to talk about, um, you know, how many AU Mars is from the Sun, that's how many times Mars is from the Sun compared to the distance Earth is from the Sun. One AU is about 93 million miles or about 150 million kilometers. So that's just, instead of writing 93 million miles or whatever, we use the AU as a unit for inter-solar system calculations. Okay? This is 
um, a animation showing how this works. You can see Mercury is this is over this animation is one year long. You can see Mercury's flying around like crazy down here. You can see the Earth going around. It takes one year for the Earth go, to go around. Um, you can see this arrow here pointing out the zodiac. Um, and then uh, it's kind of hard to see, but these are the months um, on the animation. But then you see Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus, and look at this, Neptune is just barely moving in the course of a year. So that's what Newton's, um, uh, or sorry, Kepler's third law is. It just says the further away you are, the slower you're orbiting. So in summary, the first law, orbits are ellipses. The second law, equal areas and equal times. It just means you move fastest when you're closest to the star. And the third law, the further away the planet is, the longer it takes to orbit. And it depends on p squared equals a cubed. So this, um, if you're twice as far away, it doesn't take twice as long for you to orbit. It's uh, this, you know, a cubed over the square root of a cubed, so the three halves um, to, to get the period. Okay, so um, that's the three laws. And it, he, Kepler figured that out by 20 years of data. So, Newton then took this, and Newton used to say, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, and he considered uh, Kepler and um, Galileo and all these folks giants. Newton took all their work and continued the work of what they were doing. So what you need to figure out from this is learn Newton's three laws and kind of internalize them, and then explain the relationship to momentum, um, which is a concept, you know, you know, probably know what momentum is. And then talk about mass, volume, and density, which are really important concepts when we talk about the masses of planets and things like that. And then defining angular momentum. So we're just going to do a little, this is a tiny physics course, and a real short um, thing. Wow, I've, there we go, let's get to where we need to be here. Um, 3.2. So, here we go. <coughs> there is Isaac Newton, very handsome man, uh, clearly photoshopped. Okay, uh, first law, Newton's first law says that an object in motion stays in motion or at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. So that means if you throw a hockey puck on the ice rink or if you get on the ice rink and you start going, you're not going to stop unless you hit something or figure out how to use your skates to create some friction. Otherwise, you're just going to keep going forever into the universe, okay? So, Newton's second law uh, well, quickly to talk about the first law. So think about the planets. They're orbiting in circles. That's not a straight line. Something is keeping them on a circular path. What is doing that? It must be a force. So an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. And if you apply a force to something, it will accelerate. It will change its direction. And the amount that it changes depends on its mass. So Newton's second law basically says that the bigger something is, the harder it is to move. Um, and if you apply a force to something, it will move, but, you know, if it's really big, it won't move much. If it's really small, it'll move, like, a lot. Um, that's why bullets are kind of small and light, okay, so you can get them to move. Um, the third law, okay, for every, <laughs> for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So that's, if you run into the wall, you're going to bounce off. The wall is going to hit you as hard as you hit the wall. Um, the wall has more mass, so you accelerate more, <laughs> so that's tough. Don't run into the wall. Newton's three laws. The first law is sometimes called the law of inertia. An object in motion stays in motion. It has momentum. It wants to keep going. Um, it's hard to stop, okay? Uh, momentum depends on two things. How fast an object is moving, which we call its velocity, and then how massive the object is, okay? The bigger something is, the harder it is to stop. You can think of trying to stop a train compared to trying to stop a toddler, right? One of these things is easier, even if they're both moving three miles an hour, one of them has a lot less mass, okay? It's a lot easier to do. So, Newton's first law says that an object's momentum remains unchanged unless it is acted upon by an outside force. Newton's second law says that the more massive an object is, the more force you're going to need to change its momentum, okay? That's what we're talking about here. And Newton's third law is how rockets work. You shoot force out the back, that same force is used to push the rocket up. Um, and that's what's going on here. You're pushing things out, which is pushing you up. And so you're leaving some fuel behind in order to propel yourself forward. Newton's three laws involve three important quantities, mass, volume, and density. Mass is related to the number of atoms. Volume is how much space the atoms take up. And density is just mass divided by the volume. So 
You can think of a high density thing as lead or concrete. There's a lot of atoms squished into a small area. Or low density, you could think of styrofoam, wood, something light. You could toss around a foam ball and it's not very heavy. Compared to a bowling ball, it would be a lot harder to juggle that. Okay, um, in other words, mass is how much something has, volume is how big something is, and density is how tightly packed that mass is in that volume. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's really important to, when we talk about a neutron star being very dense compared to the crust of the Earth or gas in space, to, to have a good sense of what density is, you're thinking of, you know, how many atoms per volume are there? Are they all smashed in here or are they kind of spread out? So that's what you want to take away from this. Um, okay, angular momentum. Angular momentum, Kepler's second law is due to the law of conservation of angular momentum. So angular momentum is a number that depends on uh, three properties, velocity, mass, and the radius of orbit. Okay, so when an object falls towards a planet, it speeds up, and as it moves away, it slows down, and as it falls towards, it speeds up, and slows down and speeds up, and that's, the, that's Kepler's second law, the law of equal areas. The reason this happens is because of angular momentum. So think about it this way. Angular momentum is mv over r, okay? You can think of it as, I'm simplifying it here, but <coughs> think of it as these three qu quantities, mass, velocity, radius. Okay, that's what defines angular momentum. Angular momentum is always the same number. So let's say mass has a value of 3, let's say velocity has a value of 3, radius has a value of 3. I'm leaving the units off just to uh, explain what's going on here. If you take 3 times 3 times 3, you get 27. So now we know that our whole system has angular momentum of 27. Alright, how else can you get 27? If it's conserved, that means 27 doesn't change. Our total angular momentum is always going to be 27. But we could have 27, same mass, 3, but we can just make the thing move faster and have it be closer to the thing. So the radius is only 1, but the velocity is 9. So this would be like Mercury. It's really close to the sun, so it has a radius of 1, but it's moving really fast, so it goes around the sun really quickly. Um, if you uh, are Earth or something, you might be further away. Or you could get it this way. You could have a really heavy object really close to the uh, sun, but not moving very fast, okay? So that's the idea of angular momentum. So what happens as an object gets closer to the sun? You're changing r. r is getting smaller, which means v has to get bigger. Okay? <laughs> and so that's the idea uh, behind uh, the angular momentum conservation. So point is here, if you change one of the parameters, mass, velocity, or radius, the other parameters have to change too, so that the total angular momentum does not change. It's like changing money between your checking and savings accounts or whatever. You have the same amount of money you can move it from one thing to the other. You can increase the velocity, but you got to take it from the radius. Or you can increase the radius, but you got to take it from the velocity. You know, something like that. This is a great example of that. This uh, ice skater, uh, figure skater, starts with her arms and legs really far out, so her mass is spread out, far away, big radius. Okay? Um, big radius, but as she reduces the radius, she's going to increase her velocity because the angular momentum has to stay the same, and since she's reducing her radius, your velocity is going to have to go up. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and this kind of thing, this is what happens as gas falls in, it starts to speed up, and then that's how you can get planets and stars forming and other things. So, and that's how why galaxies are rotating disks and solar systems are in orbiting like this, is because of angular momentum. So it's a really important concept to get a, uh, get a handle on. Okay, so Newton's, um, and there's our figure skater over here. Okay, um, Newton's universal law of gravitation, what you want to get out of here is explaining what determines the strength of gravity. So what causes gravity, and then describe Newton's law of gravity and how it extended Kepler's laws. So Newton's first law says that an object stays in motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an outside force. But planets don't orbit in straight lines, do they? They orbit in, mm -hmm, what? ellipses, okay? Therefore, you gotta have a force causing them to orbit in ellipses. Newton called this force gravity, and he discovered, in, or invented, depending on your perspective, calculus trying to explain gravity. So where does calculus come from? It came from Newton trying to explain gravity. 
So Newton realized that the same force that causes apples to fall boop on your head, the same force that attracts a, an apple down, is the same force that keeps the moon in orbit around the sun, is the same force that keeps the moon, the moon in orbit around the earth, is the same force that keeps the moon and the earth in orbit around the sun. Okay? So if he studied the motion of these things, he could, he could figure out the laws of motion for the whole universe. This is Newton's law of gravitation, which says that the force between two objects, M1 and M2, for example, the Earth and the Moon, all it depends upon, if you want to know the force between two things, you just need to know their masses, M1 and M2, and how far apart they are. G is a constant called Newton's constant. It doesn't change. <laughs> it's always the same. But mass of Earth, mass of the Moon, distance between them squared. That's it. If you know those things, you can calculate the force of gravity between two objects. That's crazy. This may look like a slightly difficult equation, but hopefully maybe it doesn't look that complicated and it seems kind of weird that that's all you have to do to figure out the force between two celestial bodies. Earth, moon, earth, sun, just replace them with the proper values. Okay, it's an inverse square law. Why? Because it's 1 over r squared, which means if you go twice as far away, it's r squared. So you're, the strength of gravity is a fourth. If you go three times, it's a ninth. Four times, it's a sixteenth. Five times, it's a twenty-fifth. Six times, it's 1 over r squared. 1 over 6 squared. So gravity gets weaker with distance, proportional to 1 over r squared. This explains Kepler's third law, which says that as you go further away from a star, you take longer to orbit. Why? Because gravity is so much weaker out there. So that's an extension of Kepler's law is this law of gravitation. Okay, this also means that force is, the force of gravity is a property of mass. The more mass something has, if we go back to that equation, the bigger M is, the bigger F is. Okay, so the more mass you have, the more gravity you have. Uh, the more mass an object has, the stronger the force of gravity. Um, that's a thing. Okay, so the most important thing to take away from this is that you can determine how massive objects are by studying their orbits. This means that we can learn the masses of planets on around other stars. We can learn the plant the masses of stars, other stars using the planets that are orbiting them. We can figure out how massive stars are in binary star system. We can figure out like we'll do in one lab, the mass of Jupiter using one of the moons uh, of Jupiter. So just based on the orbits and using Newton's law of gravitation, we can figure out a whole lot of information. And so that's your main takeaway from this, because we're trying to get you to learn um, how we know these things. Um, this is one of the main things, is Newton's law of gravitation. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, how we can use Kepler's laws, Newton's laws, to figure out properties of um, celestial bodies. Okay, um, section 3.4 is just specifically about orbits in the solar system. Our goal here is to understand orbital characteristics of planets and objects in the solar system. There's some key terms about an orbit, and that's the perihelion, which is the closest point in an orbit. Remember, they're elliptical orbits, and when you're closest to the star, you're at perihelion. When you're furthest away, you're at aphelion. And then perigee and apogee are the same terms. Perigee and perihelion are the same thing, apogee and aphelion are the same thing, except you only use perigee and apogee when you're talking about objects orbiting the Earth. G and is Greek for Earth, so um, those are the same words, they just correspond to things orbiting Earth. Okay, so according to Kepler's third law, Mercury, since it's closest to the Sun, has to have the shortest period. And it does, it takes 88 days for Mercury to orbit the Sun. Neptune has the longest. It takes 165 years for um, uh, Neptune to orbit the Sun. And here's the other planets and their, their times here on this chart, so uh, you can study that. Um, the eight planets, we're talking about just the properties, they lie in a plane, they're all orbiting the Sun in a plane that doesn't deviate more than 10 degrees from each other. So it's pretty flat, the eight planets. Uh, Pluto is a little weird. Instead of being within 10 degrees, it's 17 degrees, so it's a little bit outside the plane of the solar system. And then another dwarf planet like Pluto um, is inclined by even 44 degrees, so it's way out there, has a highly inclined orbit. <coughs> In addition to the planets, there are asteroids and comets. 
uh, and we'll talk more about them later in the textbook. Comets um, come from outside Pluto. They come from something called the Oort cloud, which is beyond even the Kuiper belt. Some of the things lie in the Kuiper belt. Um, we'll talk about that. It's the area beyond Pluto. Uh, asteroids, they live between Jupiter and Mars, or between Mars and Jupiter, if you want to think of it that way. That's where a lot of the leftover construction pieces of the solar system are. That's what we think asteroids are. Asteroids are, you know, within the solar system, moderately uh, elliptical orbits. Comets have highly elliptical orbits, which means they spend most of their time um, away from the sun. So when they're further away, they're moving slowly, and as they get close to the sun, they move fast and then go back out and so on. So that's Kepler's second law uh, dictating that as well. So here's a picture. You can see all the planets. If you looked at this picture, you would not be able to tell that Jupiter has an elliptical orbit, for example. They're very close to circular. But if you looked at um, Halley's Comet, for example, you'd say, oh, that's definitely, that's definitely elliptical. And some of these other uh, dwarf planets and uh, asteroids might be seem more elliptical, but still pretty circular. All right, so then when we talk about the uh, motions of satellites and spacecraft, what you want to understand after studying this is just how do we get satellites in orbit? And then how do we get out of orbit if we don't want to be in orbit anymore? <laughs> So there's two types of orbits, bound and unbound, or uh, closed and open orbits. And unbound orbits have a hyperbolic or parabolic shape to them, and bound orbits are elliptical. So if you want to, if you're on, let's say if this is the Earth, and you're on a rocket that's orbiting the Earth, but you want to go to the Moon, you need to make sure your trajectory matches a parabola, y equals x squared, something like that, or a hyperbolic uh, line. Okay, if as you're launching and you're matching your trajectory and it matches a uh, parabola, then you can be pretty confident that you're going to leave the orbit. If it starts to deviate from that, you might fall back into the Earth, you might get trapped in an orbit. So those are the three types of orbits, um, hyperbolic, parabolic, which are unbound, and then elliptical orbits, which are bound. Okay, so in order to put something into orbit, you need to get it moving fast enough so that as it falls, um, its trajectory matches the curvature of the Earth. Okay, so what does that mean? Newton had this idea, Newton's cannonball. If you went up on a mountain high enough and you started launching things off fast enough, it would start to, as it, it would travel further before it landed. And if you could get it going fast enough, it would always run out of the Earth, and the Earth would always curve around before it had a chance to hit it. And so that's what an orbit is. You're going fast enough, so you're outrunning the curvature of the Earth. So as you uh, fall, the Earth is curving at the same rate that you're falling, okay? So that's kind of cool. Your trajectory matches the curvature of the Earth, basically. So this guy is the first untethered orbit. He's got some fire extinguishers duct taped to his back. So he can direct himself around. But he's moving, you know, several thousand miles an hour. Uh, that to the, you know, flying away. Um, because he's falling towards the Earth, he's definitely falling towards the Earth, but he's going fast enough this way that he's outrunning that curvature. So, um, wouldn't be me. I don't know. I kind of want to do it. So, uh, let's think about it. Uh, okay, and then we've got a picture here with all the junk in space, um, all over the satellites. Obviously, they're exaggerated in size, um, but those are the, uh, the locations. You can see there's a lot of near-Earth uh, satellites there. Okay, so um, if you have more than two objects, they can interact with each other gravitationally. You could see that effect. Um, so what you want to get out of here is just explain how multiple interactions can cause slight perturbations to uh, the orbits. And this is how Neptune was discovered. So we just want to understand the history of that. It's pretty easy to determine the orbits of two objects interacting gravitationally. It's also relatively easy to determine the motions of planets when their masses are so small compared to the mass of the Sun. So in our solar system, you can basically look at Earth and the Sun and ignore everything else, or look at Jupiter and the Sun and ignore everything else, because the Sun is so big compared to the other things that uh, the effect of Jupiter on Earth is small compared to the effect of the Sun on Earth. So the thing, though, is once you get into very, very precise measurements of the orbits of the planets, you can see deviations due to the other planets. Um, the effect of their gravity acting on Earth, for example. So this is how Neptune was discovered, in fact, and this was a testament to Newton's theory. It was like, whoa, we predicted it. Holy cow. 
basically there was a small discrepancy in Uranus's orbit. It wasn't exactly where they predicted. It was about 0.03 degrees off. Um, using Newton's law, an eighth planet was hypothesized, uh, hypothesized to get rid of the, of the discrepancy. Um, and on September 23rd, 1846, Neptune was discovered exactly where they predicted it, somewhere in the sky, and they said that it should be there. They found it, and that fixed it. Okay, so that's what you should take away from uh, this chapter. Basically, understanding Kepler's laws and Newton's laws and just having an idea of how we think about orbits um, and how uh, all that stuff kind of works. And then, again, make sure you're going through the key terms here um, and the chapter summaries uh, to really understand uh, internalized things and make it easier to succeed. All right, see you guys another time.